tricks. Some of you who are newer to the game may not have heard the term quick tricks very much. You know, when you start out, we're taught to evaluate our hands for possible openings by counting high card points. And uh, the first person who did that was Charles Gorin. Back when bridge was just beginning, the kind of bridge as we know it today, uh, there was a player by the name of Ellie Culbertson, and uh, he and his wife, Josephine, played together for quite a while and were married for a time, obviously, since they were husband and wife. They, they did not stay married, but they played together for quite a while. And there is a convention that's called Josephine, after Josephine, which I think is kind of interesting. But the whole idea behind opening, according to Mr. Culbertson, uh, was that you needed to be able to take a certain number of tricks. Uh, and he, he devised the system that he called quick tricks as a way of determining whether your hand had enough prime values in it, what we know as prime values, that is aces and kings, uh, that it would have both some defensive capability and offensive capability. And he came up with the idea that a, a hand that was worth opening should have two and a half quick tricks in it, and that a game can be made when there is a combined total of five quick tricks between the two hands. That this was this was a, a set of hands that was likely to produce a game. Uh, and as I said, he thought you needed that particular benchmark because it enables you to uh, judge the defensive capabilities of an opening hand as well uh, and not just offense. You know, if you have a long suit that you might, uh, that's in a hand that you might consider opening with a preempt, then uh, you have a lot of offensive tricks as long as that suit is the trump suit. But you may not have much on defense. That's that's part of the idea behind preempting, taking up the bidding space and trying to buy the contract in your suit when you have a lot of them and not very many points. Uh, but now several people modified his ideas and decided that it, the whole idea of quick tricks could be used not just when you're evaluating your hand for opening, but for also um, using a takeout double or making a penalty double or whether you could uh, use it to set up a forcing pass situation, um, balancing all these things that you could use quick tricks to make decisions for all of those as well. But uh, the most common way still to use quick tricks is the way that Mr. Culbertson devised it. It is a really good system to use in conjunction with high card points. There are several different ways of evaluating a hand for opening and point count is one, quick tricks is one, losing trick count is another. Uh, and I'll get into that in a week or two, but uh, it's more much more useful to have more than one way to evaluate a hand. You can use it to reinforce your decision, or you can use it to say, oh, well, I think my initial impression wasn't as good as the high card points might indicate. And the main thing it helps you do is distinguish prime values from soft values. In other words, the whole idea behind Quick Tricks is that not all high card points are created equal. A hand that has queen jack 10 third, queen jack 10 third, queen jack 10 third, queen jack 10 fourth in it has 12 high card points in it, but it's not a hand that I would open. And the idea of quick tricks just gives you something to hang hang your hat on when you're when you're trying to decide whether your high card points are worth an opening bid. Now, as I said later on, Charles Gorin. Uh, converted the idea of quick tricks into the equivalent high card points because it's a you know a little bit easier to just count up high card points 
uh, rather than sitting there thinking, okay, this is a half a quick trick. This is a one and a half quick tricks and, and doing math like that in your head. Uh, and so you can understand why that became very popular. The problem with the high card point method is that it undervalues aces and kings and overvalues queens and jacks. Uh, really, an ace is worth about four and a quarter. But who wants to sit there and say, well, this is 4.25 and here's a 1.5 and here's a 1.25. I mean, that would drive you crazy. So what I like to do when I'm when I'm looking at my hand and there's any question in my mind about whether I'm going to open it is I count the high card points and then I say, all right, how many quick tricks do I have? Because many times uh when high card points are not aligned well, then your hand doesn't produce the number of tricks that it otherwise might. Uh, and this means that you're not going to be making your decision until it's time for you to open or overcall here uh, because it's not really clear when you when you add your your high card points up and then look at your quick tricks, you may really be on the fence. Uh, and of course, then that's when you have to use a little bit of, of judgment based on your experience. Now, having said all of this, so when am I going to open? Well, Charles Gorin said we open all 14 point hands regardless of the quick trick count because it is virtually impossible not to have, well, it is totally impossible not to have one quick trick and the odds that there will be a second one in the hand are about 99% in favor of it. So his attitude was all 14 point hands should be opened. 13 point hands with two and a half quick tricks should be opened as well. Because as I said earlier, Culbertson says that two hands with a combined total of five quick tricks in them will generally produce a game. Well, if you notice, you have two hands with 13 points and two and a half quick tricks in them. This is 26 high card points and five quick tricks. So it makes sense that this is a standard. This is one way that, that you can say, I'm definitely going to open this hand. So if we've said all of this, how do I count quick tricks? Well, Karen Walker has a, a, a nice article on opening the bidding on her website and she describes quick tricks and this is this is a, a pretty standard thing here uh, and this is what she shows if you have just an ace that's always going to be one quick trick king and queen together make one quick trick a king by itself is a half a quick trick because obviously Half of the time it will take a trick if the ace is on your right, that is if your partner doesn't have it. If the ace is on your right, then the king will take a trick. But if the ace is on your left, uh, it it's not very likely that it's going to take a trick. So half the time it will take a trick generally. And this is, this is just a, a series of probabilities. Quick tricks are really just based on what the probabilities are that your card combination will produce the number of tricks suggested. So here with the ace queen, we have one and a half quick tricks because you'll always get a trick with the ace and half the time you'll get a trick with the queen. Uh, that is unless a defender helps you and leads right up into that into that uh, tennis for you, then, then you will always get two. But assuming that you have to tackle the suit yourself, you'll get one and a half quick tricks out of this combination. And of course, ace king together is always two quick tricks. So the problem with opening a hand that doesn't have sufficient quick tricks in it, in other words, the values are all very soft, is that if you open the bidding, your partner is going to make certain assumptions about what your hand contains in it. And if you get in the habit of opening hands that have way too much in the way of soft values in them, in other words, they're quacky, what we call quacky, I know you've all heard that term, uh, then your partner may double a contract and it'll make way too often. Uh, your own games and slams may fall short. 
uh, and sometimes competitive decisions result in unmitigated disasters because you took a flyer and partner assumed you were being your usual disciplined self and uh, bid basically on that assumption and you end up with another bad board. So uh, it really helps when you're thinking about opening a hand to evaluate it with more than one standard. Uh, so if you can learn to use quick tricks in a combination with high card points, you will end up making better decisions as to what kind of hand should be opened. These days, people open all 12 point hands. Uh, I open most of them, but there are 12 point hands that I would not, like the one I described earlier. If I have a hand with no shape and no aces, I'm going to downgrade that hand all day long. Because, hey, Susan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Question in the chat. Uh, would you consider ace, king, queen to be three quick tricks? Well, sure. Uh, but that's, you don't count more than ace, king, queen usually. The problem is with counting that as three, that's fine on offense if you're, if you end up uh, declaring the hand. But be aware if the opponents take the contract in a suit, you may not get that third trick. Um, but certainly if you're evaluating whether you can open your hand, I, I would count that as three quick tricks if, if I'm thinking about opening. Absolutely. But when I'm thinking about a possible penalty double or something like that, and they're in a suit contract, then I'm, I'm going to be a little bit more circumspect. Sorry to hedge, but there, there, there are not very many things in bridge that can be said totally in black and white. Uh, or that work all the time. The rule of 11 is one, but usually judgment or a modicum of judgment uh, will result in better outcomes for you. So remember the contract that you're going to be playing when, when you start making these decisions. So here's, here's basically what Mr. Gorin said was open all hands with 14 or more and open a hand with notice 10 11, 12, or 13 points if the hand and the conditions meet at least two or three of the following requirements. Now, if my hand has 13 high card points in it, I'm, I'm probably going to open it because with 13, I'm, I, I'm, I have a pretty good chance of having at least two quick tricks, so I will probably open it. Uh, but if the hand has two or more quick tricks in it, uh, then I'm I'm going to open it. And if it has two and a half quick tricks in it, that's a Colbertson opening. Uh, my opponents at the table and, and my partners have heard me say after the play of play of uh, the hand that well I had a Colbertson opening. That means that I had two and a half quick tricks in my hand. I may not have had twelve high card points but I had two and a half quick tricks at least. If the hand has fewer than two quick tricks, uh, you should probably take a step back. Now this assumes first or second seat, all right? First or second seat only. Uh, if you have fewer than two quick tricks, then uh, like what one of the, one of my teachers I had back in the early days would, would say, Susan, where are your tricks? Don't be opening that hand just because it has 12 high card points in it. Where are your tricks? This is just another way of saying you don't have two quick tricks in your hand. So here's some examples. Uh, this first one is one of my favorite kind of hands to open. This is only an 11 point hand, but it has three quick tricks in it. I am always opening that hand. Not only do I have a good opening bid, but I have a rebid as well. So I am always going to open this a hand like this first one. With ace king in one suit and ace in another, that's three quick tricks all day long, and that rates an opening bid in my book. Now, here's another one. This one doesn't have as many quick tricks, but look at the playing strength it has. It has good honors working together. It has good shape. And 
it has two quick tricks in it. One and a half for the ace queen of hearts and another one for the king of diamonds. This is two quick tricks. And this is another one that I would open. There are 12 high card points in it. Uh, but I wouldn't shy away from opening this one at all. Open it one heart, rebid two diamonds if partner doesn't support your hearts. Now, here's, here's an example of one that looks like it's a good opening hand, but notice this is a really quacky hand. The only two honors that are working together are the queen jack of spades. It, in other words, it has scattered values. And it has only one and a half quick tricks. And I can hear you already saying, oh, but everybody in the room will be opening it. That doesn't mean that they will do well. Just because you could open it doesn't mean that you're going to, number one, end up with a contract. Many of the time I have opened a sketchy hand, only had to have the opponents take the contract. And I've just told them where all the missing points are for no good reason because I had a crappy opening hand and should have kept my mouth shut. Um, sometimes I have a hard time doing that, particularly if I've been sitting in the table all day long and haven't had any decent hands. I'm liable to get impatient. Patience is not my long suit. Uh, I'm, I'm liable to get impatient and, and bid something I shouldn't. And I have often paid the price for it. So I hope the rest of you are smarter than I am in that regard. But a hand like this one, if I'm in third seat, I will open it. Uh, it is. It has 12 high card points in it, and I wouldn't hesitate to do that. But if my partner bids a major suit, I'm going to pass. But basically, I'm going to pass whatever my partner bids in response, uh, simply because I don't have four card support for any major suit. And with only 12 crappy points, I don't particularly relish rebidding one no trump. Uh, my partner's a past hand, after all, and uh, I'm I'm just I'm going to think long and hard uh, about this third one. I know that there are not many of you who would pass it, but I would certainly consider passing it. If you're a precision player, of course, you're not going to pass it because precision players open eleven point hands. But if you play standard American. Uh, think about think about whether you want to open a hand like this. There's no roughing value. Notice it, it's a four three 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 pancake here, and I always downgrade those hands. Now, if your hand has good suit quality, in other words, honors in it and good high spot cards in the long suits. So, for instance. Uh, this one has only 10 high card points in it, but look at the shape. It's a 6-4 hand. Uh, now, if you typically would open in first or second seat with only 10 high card points, uh, number one, you need your, partners, your partner to agree to it. Uh, but the other thing is you may need to alert that. I'm not sure, Don. Does, does a 10-point opener in first or second seat have to be alerted? No, but but uh, opening a 12, uh, 12 card hand might be. Oh, is that a 12? Is that right? It's 5 4, not 6 4. Yeah, it's 5 4. 5 okay. 4 2 2. It's, it's I can't count. Never mind. Okay. No, eight, uh, I hate it, but eight, eight high card points is enough. But if you consistently open that light, then we need to talk about pre alerts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, but 10, there, there's no problem with, I, no. I, I was a little concerned about this one, but then I thought, you know, uh, you've got a length point here. And I mean, look at these spade honors. Yeah. Um, no. And and then you have an outside ace here too. I'm, I would maintain that, that this hand has enough playing strength that you could consider opening it. Ab absolutely, not a problem. Yeah. This, uh, th this second one here though, I, I I have a bit of a problem with opening this one one spade. This is a 12 point hand, but I the king queen of hearts, I would rather have that king queen of hearts in the spade suit. But if you and your partner have agreed that 12 point hands are going to be opened regardless, 
I mean, you do have two quick tricks. You have one in hearts and one in diamonds. But unless partner has some help for you in spades, you're going to have a tough time here. So this is a matter of discussing these kinds of hands. Um, a lot of times people will say, well, I've got a fifth spade and that makes it worth 13. Well, yeah, if you have a fit with partner, it's worth 13. But this is the kind of hand that doesn't have nearly the playing strength that hand number one does up here, but it has more points. Uh, and that can be deceptive. Beth has a question, Susan. Go right ahead, Beth. Mm -hmm. That first little example with the king, queen, jack uh, of spades, huh? would yeah. you open that with 10 points in first seat? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. I would. Uh, and I, some people would preempt with it. Some people would preempt with a strong five card spade suit, but with 10 high card points and a couple of doubletons, I, I think, I personally think this hand is strong enough to open one spade. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't push it to two because number one, my partner will raise with only three of them. He would raise a two spade bid to to three with only three of them. And then now we don't have the law of total tricks on our side and yada, 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 yada. So if I'm going to open it, I would open it one spade uh, simply because of the playing strength. Beth, this doesn't mean that I'm suggesting that you should open 10 point hands. Right. I'm not. Uh, but there are, I'm, I'm trying to get you to consider the playing strength and what makes a good opening hand other than just being a slave to counting high card points. There's more to it than that. And the more you get into this game, the more you will realize that things like high card points and losing trick count and quick tricks are guidelines. There really is no substitute for judgment. And the only way you get good judgment is by making a lot of mistakes. Um, that's just the reality. I, I wish there were a magic potion that we could all drink, and all of a sudden we have great judgment at the table. It just doesn't work that way. Now, I, I can see it being a good overcall. But... Yeah, ab absolutely, it's a fabulous overcall. But okay. if I'm in the first seat, uh, or if I'm in the second seat and my right-hand opponent passed, I'm, and I certainly want to suggest that my partner lead a spade if he's on lead, right? So you're oh, right. It's, yeah, okay, it's, all right. It's, yeah, it's a very good, it's a wonderful overcall. Okay. Um, but uh, I would even consider, and if it doesn't suit your style, Beth, you don't have to do it. I'm not maintaining that this is for everybody. Uh, but uh, as you get more experience, uh, sometimes you get more comfortable with things that you never would have considered doing early on. Uh, that's a reality of this game also. So now another condition. Yes. Uh, uh, Janice here. Yesterday we had a hand where, we, and those of us that played we West yesterday will have had this hand. We had a hand where West had seven high card points. They had six spades, five hearts, three clubs, void and diamonds. Would you, oh, we, I know of one person that opened that one spade. Uh, I happened to pass it because of the six five situation. Would you? Well, would you, it's like would Don you, said. Oh, opening bids in seat one uh, with eight high card points are problematic. With uh, seven, I I think you're on thin ice. Uh, really? Uh, thin. Yeah, <laughs> actually, there's a, a rule of seventeen. I want to say. I'd have to go back and look at it, but it would probably be a legal opening with this with that split. Again, it's it's if if you and your partner consistently open hands like that, then we need to talk about pre alerts. But you know, I, I'll go back and see if I can find that hand, Janet. Well, yeah, and it also I would evaluate my losing trick count too, and uh, if it if if I had, I mean, obviously, if you have three small clubs, you have three losers there. I, I, you said you had ace in one suit and king in the other? No, 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 no. Um, you had king, jack, and the spades, six. Uh -huh. You had the king and hearts, fifth. You, that's all. Well, that's a that's a seven-loser seven hand, which is what most opening bids are. 
And it sounds like it meets that rule of 17 that Don was talking. They have all kinds of rules. You know, there's not just the rule of 20 and the rule of 20 plus two. Uh, the ACBL has a, a rule of 19 and a rule of 17 and, and all this kind of thing. And it will meet uh, with 11 cards in the majors and seven high card points. It meets the rule of 17. So would you uh, would you preempt that house hand or would you open it one? Then? No, no. If I'm going to do anything, because I, if I preempt, if I bid two spades, I'm saying this is the only Trump suit. I have no other suit mm -hmm. that has at least four cards in it that could be the Trump suit. And I do. I have a great heart suit besides. So if I'm doing anything, I'm opening it one, not two. OK, mm. thank you. You bet. As, as I say, that's that's my approach to it. Other people may not be comfortable with that, and that's fine. So, Susan? Yes. It's Joanne. Uh-huh. Um, on that last example at the on page, um, previous page, mm -hmm. how many uh, trick, tricks would you count in that? Uh, what, the, the last example? Yeah, the Jack eight six four three. Yeah, okay. Quick tricks or losing tricks? Quick tricks. Quick tricks. I would count one for the King Queen and one for the Ace of Diamonds. Thank you. I would call that two quick tricks. Okay, thank you. That's why this is a close call. It does have two quick tricks in it. Okay. Uh, but it, I don't like honors in short suits. I like honors in long suits, and I tend to downgrade hands that that looked like this one. Um, okay, thank you. You bet. They're not as good as the high card point count would uh, indicate to me. Now, the, one an, another condition that might be met is that there is an easy rebid. Uh, either you have a two-suited hand or you have a six-card suit that you can repeat. So, for instance, here, this only has 11 high card points in it. But I'm going to open a heart and rebid two clubs. This is this this looks totally totally acceptable to me, and that is because I have good honors here in hearts, and I have a good my honors are all in my two suits. This is one thing that that says I'm I'm interested in opening this hand. It only has 11 high card points in it, but it has two quick tricks. It has the king, queen, and the jack of hearts, and it has the ace of clubs. So this is one that also gets my vote in favor of opening. This next one has 11 points in it, and a lot of people would preempt this one two diamonds. I think this hand with its shape uh, is is a bit strong for a two diamond opening and I would open it one diamond and rebid two diamonds um, simply because with 11 points in a six card suit in my book that's a one bid I never preempt with more than 10 high card points in my hand and sometimes with 10 high card points I don't preempt 10, 10 high card points and a six card suit a lot of people consider a one bid Depends on the suit quality to me. Uh, if the suit quality isn't great, then I might open it one because I, if I preempt at the two level, my suit quality is going to be pretty good, particularly if I'm vulnerable. I'm a disciplined week two bidder. Not everybody is. So if I have a, a suit, 10 points and a six card suit, but it doesn't meet my standards, for a, a week two, I may open it one, particularly if it's a major. I have 10 high, 10 high card points and a six card suit. I have an easy rebid. And, and uh, I'm not promising my partner a fabulous suit when I do that. Susan, there's a chat question on the hand before that, that you open one heart, planning uh -huh. to rebid two clubs. What uh -huh. if your partner bids two diamonds in there? Well... Hmm, I might be in the corner and have to, well, we're in a game force. Uh, so I'm not worried about bidding three clubs. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, I mean, I, I play two over one. So if my partner bids two diamonds, I don't have a problem bidding three clubs. 
Uh, but if you don't play two over one, then you need to consider whether whether this hand uh, is an appropriate opener for you. But it has 11 high card points and a five card suit. Uh, I would not want to rebid two no trump without a stopper in the unbid major, but that's just me. Uh, Roy has his hand up. Yes, Roy. Susan, if you play two over one on this uh, king, queen, jack of hearts uh, mm -hmm. example, and your partner rebids a spade, Mm -hmm. Is it more important to bid one no trump and show you do not have support for spades or to bid the clubs? No, I bid two clubs because that denies four card support for spades also. Okay, so you don't don't need to use the no trump. No, uh, -uh. that that uh, if I don't raise spades immediately, I deny having five hearts and four spades. Okay, thank you. You bet. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the Another um, requirement that you might be able to meet would be that the hand has length and strength in the major suits. The major suits are the be all end all here in the game of bridge. I mean, we play minors only when forced, right? Uh, here's an example. I have two four card majors a stiff, I have the, the classic four, 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 one, four in this particular instance. Uh, I have only 11 points, but look at the shape I have. It doesn't matter which major suit my partner bids, I'm raising. And my hand has gone from being worth 11 points for, I can now count points for that stiff diamond. I'm not counting them ahead of time because we don't have a fit yet. But if partner responds one diamond, then I'm going to bid one hard. And if he responds one of a major, I'm raising to the two level immediately. Because even counting points for the stiff, I'm still not strong enough to give a jump raise. Even though I have four cards in the major suit, I need to make the invitational strength requirement to jump a level, not just have four cards in the suit. Now, contrast that hand with this one. Here I have, let's see, five, eight, 11 high card points, five clubs and four diamonds. If you open a club, you don't have, a, if partner bids one spade, what are, you, what are you going to bid? You have a singleton in his suit. You're not strong enough to reverse to two diamonds and you certainly can't bid hearts and you only have a five card club suit. This is a really awkward rebid. Some people will open one diamond planning to rebid two clubs, but if my partner can take I mean, I find myself playing a four two fit. I have been in that situation often enough to know that playing a four two fit generally does not work out well. The opponents have more trumps than you do. So with this particular hand, I'm 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 not at all thrilled with the idea of opening it because I'm going to have a very awkward rebid here. Unless my partner bids one no trump. If he bids one no trump, I just put down the green card and go on and say, good luck, partner. Um, but if he bids a spade, I'm in trouble. If he bids a diamond, I'll just bid two diamonds. Uh, if he bids a heart, well, then I have to rebid one no trump with a stiff and an unbid major. This is one time when I would strongly consider raising my partner's one heart response with only three cards because I don't want to bid no trump with a singleton and an unbid major. I don't have six clubs and I'm not strong enough to reverse into two diamonds. So this is the kind of hand that I have when I raise one of a major to two of a major with only three card support. I have an honor and I have two small ones for roughing spades if partner needs to rough spades. So if partner bids a heart, I don't have a problem. But if he bids a spade, I'm in deep trouble. Deep trouble. Susan, so yes. Question. When uh -huh. do you take when do you take into account Links points when you're figuring out when to open? 
Well, there are some who say you don't add anything for distribution until you found a fit. There are other people like Audrey Grant who say add one point for any any car, any suit that has um, more than four cards in it. One, one point for each card beyond four. Uh, this is a matter for you and your partner to discuss. Uh, this hand, if, if you count the fifth club, is worth 12 points. But when people talk about opening 12-point hands, they typically mean 12 high card points. So this one is 11 high card points. Uh, and I don't have a good rebid on this hand. So I don't call this a 12-point hand. I call it an 11-point hand with a five-card suit in it. There's a difference. Uh, give, give me the queen of diamonds instead of the jack or the ace of hearts instead of the king, something like that, or stick the jack in, stick the jack of clubs in with my club suit, and I'm a little more comfortable but not a lot because I don't have a good rebid. One thing that you have to remember is that when you open the bidding and your partner forces you to bid again by bidding a new suit, then uh, you better be thinking about what you're gonna rebid. Because if your partner can give you a problem on the rebid, the odds are pretty good that he will. Looking at this hand, I would bet money that my partner's gonna bid one spade. Somebody's got the spades. And in my experience, it's usually my partner when I have the single. So, uh, but as I say often, you pay your money and you take your chances when you open a hand like this. And now uh, Beth and Deborah Duncan have hands up. Okie doke. Well, this is taking longer than I thought it would. Okay, go ahead, Beth. In that example right above that one, um, where you said you would, you didn't have enough for a limit raise. No, um, opener opener has to have 16 to 18 points. Uh, that's not a limit raise. The limit raise is responder's bid, not opener's bid. Now, on the first example, like if you bid a club and then your partner bid a heart or a spade, you said you don't have enough to make a limit raise with four of either one. No, no, no. I said I don't have enough to make a jump raise. Oh, okay. So could you yeah. go, well, wait a minute. What would the bid be then? The, the bid would be at the two level rather than the three level. I've seen a lot of people jump to the three level with four card support with hands like this. When you jump to the three level, your partner's only promising you six points. When he bids a new suit, if he bids a heart, he's promising you at least four hearts and at least six points, but that's all. He may not have one little bitty drop more than that. So... If oh, you, that's right. Okay. Yeah. If you jump to three uh, numbers here, you're going to be in the soup. Because you're, you're the five. opener. You're the yes. opener. Okay. All right. I, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that's okay. A lot of people get confused because the standards are different based on whether you're the opener or the responder. If right. I'm holding, if I'm holding this hand, uh, and let's, uh, let me say, what would it take? Give me the ace of diamonds there instead of the six. Then uh, if my if I open a club, and my partner rebids one heart or one spade, then I will jump. But I don't have enough to jump here because I'm promising my partner I have a hand worth 16 to 18 total points when I do that. And I don't have it. <laughs> so now then, if you're vulnerable, this is going to sound antithetical to you. If you're vulnerable, you might open the the hand uh, even if you don't have what you might consider a full opener, if you have a lot of distribution. For instance, here's an 11-point hand with six hearts in it. I'm, I'm never bidding two hearts with this hand because the suit is, um, if I'm vulnerable here, this is not good enough for a vulnerable two-level preempt in the first or second seat, particularly the second seat. But I would rather open one heart and rebid two hearts than to overcall two hearts later on down the road with such a crappy suit. Now, move the ace from the diamonds over here. I mean, yeah, well, with 11 points, I'm still opening one heart. Take away the jack of clubs and I have 10 and I have to think about it for a minute. But 
with this with this hand, I I will not open two hearts ever. The suit's just not good enough, especially vulnerable. Uh, but I don't mind opening it one heart. That sounds funny, doesn't it? But if I don't open now, I'm going to have to bid two hearts or maybe I don't get in the auction at all by the time it comes back around to me. And I would like to suggest to my partner that we might be able to play hearts. If he's got six or seven points and three or four hearts, well, why not? But um, if I'm not vulnerable, then I'll, uh, if my partner and I are okay with it, then I will think about whether I would bid a week two with that hand because um, if I'm not vulnerable, then it's then it's a horse of a different color, particularly third seat. Um, so I I think that um, this is a matter for partnership agreement. If you're not vulnerable, but when I'm vulnerable and I want to get my heart suit in, I like to do it early. Uh, if my partner bids no trump or doesn't force me at all or if he he bids and my right hand opponent bids then i don't have to bid again my partner has another call so uh i vulnerable especially though i want to get my heart suit in while i still can now this hand on the other hand has a six card heart suit in it it only has nine high card points, but it has a void in it. Look how much playing strength there is in this hand. But I'm, I, Don says, you know, that an eight card, eight high card point opening is okay. Well, that would mean that a nine high card point opening would be okay. But as he said, if you're going to do this typically, then you have to talk about pre-alerting if you're going to do it this it's it's too strong a hand that has six cards in it that meets the requirements particularly for a vulnerable week two and also has a void number one it has a lot of playing strength and number two if there's a void in it there's another suit that has four cards in it if you have a six card suit that means you have seven outstanding you have at least one four card suit and you may have a five card suit when you, when you bid two hearts here, you're telling partner, this is it. If we're going to play this hand, we have to play it in hearts. Well, we could play it in clubs, or if partner has five diamonds, we could play it in diamonds. This is what happens when you have a void and a six-card suit. You have the potential to have other places to play. And the idea behind a week two bid is that you announce, this is where we have to play it, partner. No exceptions. Now, Questions from yeah. Deborah Duncan and Peter. Oh, yes. Go ahead, Deborah. I'm back on the previous page <clears throat> where um, under the example where there's a single spade and, uh -huh. and three hearts, four diamonds, and six, uh, five uh, clubs. Mm -hmm. um, the opening bid is one diamond is that correct no one club one club i i thought i was told at one time that if you have um that if you have less or thir less than 13 points and you have make uh, minors like that you should open the diamond first and then well, read as i as i said if your partner takes a preference back to your first bid suit with two cards in the suit assuming you have five because when when you bid one minor and rebid the other one you're implying an unbalanced hand with longer long more cards in the first bid suit than the second partner will take a preference back to your first bid suit because that strongly implies five four distribution I don't like being left in four two fits. And okay. that, that's what happens when you open a diamond and rebid two clubs here. If if partner has equal length, he will take a preference to diamonds. Always. That's what he's supposed to do. So you can't be upset when he does what he's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like distorting my hand for that reason. Uh, but, but I have an awkward rebid. Which if, might indicate that you have a reverse. 
Now, right. well, if I bid, yeah, well, I can't reverse. I cannot rebid two diamonds over a one heart or one spade or one no trump bid by my partner. I cannot. I don't have the high card strength to do it. So if my partner bids hearts, I'm going to raise hearts with three of them. If my partner bids spades, I, I, I might have to bid one no trump. I don't like it bidding one no trump with a singleton in my partner's suit. Uh, but I have a choice between bidding one no trump or rebidding a moth-eaten five-card club suit. Neither okay. one of those is attractive. And this is what gives me pause on these kinds of 11-point hands. Gotcha. This hand has trouble written all over it to me. And mm -hmm. it's not it's not a 12 point hand. And yeah, I've you know, I'm I may not come out on the best end of this board by opening, but there's an equally good chance that I could come out on a really bad end of the board if I do open it. So uh depending and it depends on my mood that day. I'll I'll just be honest. Some days I'm a little more aggressive than others, but this this hand I've I've been caught in this dilemma too many times to say I don't want to play a four two diamond fit, I don't want to rebid that club suit. Um, I'm only okay if my partner bids one diamond or one heart, but my experience is that my partner's going to bid one spade. That's just life in the big city, so yeah. that's the reason I bid the way I do. Okay, thank you. And Peter. Peter, yeah. go right ahead. Mm -hmm. Also on the previous page, the mm -hmm. second the second example from the bottom is the one spade and uh -huh. um, if you had only 10 points, let's say you mentioned the jack of clubs not being there. Mm -hmm. Would the, would you call this a weak? Would you open it a weak one heart or is it slightly too strong for that? Well, I I would be very hesitant to open that two hearts because my partners and I have a, a stricter standard for a vulnerable week too. Uh, so if I had the Jack of hearts though, instead of the Jack of clubs, King Jack nine is mm, stretching it a little bit, but I like my shape. I'm not six, three, two, two. I, I have a stiff. And if I have a better heart suit, I'm, I'm much more comfortable with bidding two hearts vulnerable than I would be with this particular hand opening a week two. So you uh, just pass. That makes sense. So you would pass? Um uh, no, I'd open it one heart. Even with 10 points. Um yeah, I'd give it, I would give it, I would give it serious consideration, yes. I have a rebid. And I have a lot of playing strength. That's I have a six card suit and a singleton, and I I would give it very serious consideration. Uh, if that's not your style, that's okay. That's okay. Um, there's a there are very 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 many different styles of playing bridge. Some are extremely conservative, like Frank Stewart, and others are very aggressive, like Marty Bergen. Both yeah. can do well. But but then but but you feel like the heart shape is too bad to to to. to yeah, open. I don't. The, my standards for a vulnerable week two include more than one honor in the suit. Yeah, God, thanks. Mm -hmm. And Susan, on the last one there. Yeah. The question of uh, distribution points for a void. Do you take that into account? And no, decide? absolutely not. Uh, we don't have a known fit yet. I do not count anything for a void until my partner and I have found a fit. Thank you. I will add shortness points. Okay. You can count dummy points. If I were the responder and my partner opened one no trump and I'm going to transfer to hearts, I, I'm going to give myself additional additional points here. Now, it may not be a very useful void if my partner opens one no trump because he may have a lot of uh, values in spades. But I'm I'm still let's say take away take away the two jacks uh, and give me other cards rather than that, and I'm still going to bid game uh, if my partner opens a no trump because my hand has so much playing strength here. I'm, I'm going to bid the heart game. Uh, 
but I don't give myself anything for shortness if I'm considering opening the bidding. Uh, dummy points are for the potential dummy uh, and not for the opener. That's why they call them dummy points. Now, here's another thing. If you decide to open the hand, stick with it. Don't lie later just to make up for the fact that you opened with a marginal bid. If you decide that you're going to open the hand, treat it like an opener, especially if you find a fit, because your partner is going to assume that you have that full opener anyway, unless you and he have the agreement that you may be quite light sometimes, and that opens a whole other can of worms. Uh, so if you decide that you're going to open the hand, that it's, it's one that you, that you consider to be an opener for whatever reason, stick with it. If your partner gives you a two over one bid and you play the two over one game force, don't stop short of game just because you opened light. That, that more than anything, uh, will cause your partner not to trust your bids and partnership trust is so important, I can't overemphasize it. I cannot. Partnership trust is all important. Now, if you're sitting in the third seat, that means partners of past hand. Uh, I know that you've all heard of opening light in the third seat. Uh, opening with 10 or 11 points is almost a given. I've been known to open in third seat with as few as eight. Uh, anything less than that, and I risk having my partners beat me about the head and shoulders. But I I, I played with a partner uh, who one time when we were playing at the club passed past three spades. We were white, the opponents were red, and I looked at my hand and I thought, oh, I have three spades in my hand. I can raise to four spades in a competitive auction. And then I looked at the board. White versus red, third seed. I thought, oh, he doesn't even have seven spades in his hand. I can't raise that. I can't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Uh, sure enough, it went pass, pass, pass. He had three points in his hand, a queen jack of spades, and only six of them. But he, he bid three spades in the third seat, white versus red. Uh, because our agreement was, in that situation, anything goes. And, of course, he did not make the bid, but we got a stone top because he, he crowded the bidding space so much that the opponents couldn't get in. The hand belonged to them. We went down two, undoubled, for 100 points. So in third seat, uh, particularly if you're not vulnerable and the opponents are, and you know by looking at your hand that the hand belongs to the opponents uh, because your, your partner did not open and your right-hand opponent didn't open. Maybe you have only five or six points, but if you have a long suit, don't be afraid to preempt with it. So, Susan, there's a chat question. What about if your long suit is a minor in third seat? Well, what about it? <laughs> you still go right ahead. And... <laughs> well, uh, if I have six diamonds with some decent honors at the top, I'm going to take a few liberties, maybe particularly at uh, favorable vulnerability and bid three rather than two. You know, just like my partner bid three spades instead of two spades, his hand wasn't strong enough to meet the requirements for a week two bid per our agreements. Three points, he he just can't even think about it. But there's no such no such requirement with a three-level bid. Three-level bids are destructive in nature, and two-level bids are more constructive in nature. They they tend to be uh, have more requirements imposed on them that three and four-level bids do not. So, I mean, if I've got a good diamond suit with six of them in it, maybe I'll bid three diamonds. Uh, but you need to talk to your partner before you do that. But what about if it's not a six card minor suit? Can you still open with a minor and third? Sure. Seat? 
Sure. Okay, I, I mean, when I open light, I don't open light with a minor and I don't open light with a suit. I don't want my partner to leave. That means if I have, say, say the only points I have in my hand are the ace, king, jack of spades, and it's a four card suit, I'm, I'm liable to open one spade rather than one of a minor. Because that's the suit I want my partner to leave, not the minor. In third seat, things change. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, and, and well, especially if I don't have an opening hand, I, I I don't think the hand belongs to us. It could if my partner's sitting on 10 or 11 points and decided not to open, it might belong to us. But chances are pretty good that my left-hand opponent has a, has a decent hand. And if we defend, I want my partner to get off to the best lead. So I, rather than bidding a trashy four-card minor suit, I will bid that good four-card major suit. That also requires partnership agreement, though. Uh, but if I'm light and I have just a, a crappy minor suit to bid, I, I, I don't always bid just because I could. Uh, if it's not a suit I want my partner to lead, I may I may pass anyway because you lose the element of timing if your partner gets off to a bad opening lead based on your bid. Sometimes it's better to pass and let partner choose what makes the most sense from his hand rather than leading a suit that I bid just because I had eight points and I was in third seat and I could bid. Uh, just because you can bid doesn't always mean that you should. So, so basically you're saying don't bid a convenient minor in third seat. With if you're light, if you're light, if you have a full opener, bid normally. Uh, but if, if you're considering opening an eight or nine point hand, I wouldn't do it, but you can do it if you want to. <laughs> that's, I mean, it, it's not illegal. So uh, that's, that's just something that I don't do. So uh Okay, here's some examples. Here I am sitting in the third seat. My partner passed. Uh, I don't have any singletons or voids here. So if my partner bids two hearts, I'm not going to be thrilled about it, but he's promising me five of them. He can play a five two fit. And if he bids one of the minors, he denies having three spades in his hand. So I have to hope he has five of them and I have three. I, I will pass anything that he bids. When you open light, uh, generally you don't bid again. That's one way that your partner can tell that you've opened light. Now, here you can open one club and pass whatever your partner bids also. I mean, this is an 11 point hand. This is a better hand than the first one is. Uh, but, and I would not mind if my partner led clubs. In fact, I'd be pretty happy about it. Um, I suspect though, that, uh, my left-hand opponent is going to bid something and that the opponents are going to play the hand may or may not be true, but just in case we defend, I don't mind if my partner leads, leads a club here. Um, so I would be more than happy to lead a club there. Now, that's the end of this one, and it took the entire hour. So we'll save our, our um, little extra set that I put together about uh, whether or not you should, should switch at trick two after you've won trick one on defense. Uh, we'll talk about that at another time, and we'll talk about the losing trick count as well. So, Kim, thank you for agreeing to be Rick's uh cohort or helper or keeping Rick in line, you know, whatever, whatever fits here. Uh, we appreciate it a lot. And uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Have a good weekend and happy fall y'all. Thank Tomorrow you and enjoy the game and your anniversary. Oh, I'm going to absolutely. Sooner. Yeah. Rick Sooner. Sooner. You. Don't forget that. Well, we hope Oklahoma State wins, too. They have a tough game <laughs> this afternoon. <laughs> Good hey, night, Susan. Susan. Thank you. There's a backlog of some questions if you have time to. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the first one was that Patty asked about the rule of 15 in making those decisions in third seat. I don't use the rule of 15 in third seat, only in fourth. Okay. 
Let's see. Uh, Gail Long asked about your whether you and your partner played Drury after one of those third seed open. Well, yeah, sure, but that's a subject for another lesson. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I I think the the one thing that came out of this was the importance of partnership agreement and style. Uh, you and your partner need to be on the same page with with this these openings and and you know it's certainly a topic of discussion that you should have with a reg regular partner all right let's see uh susie and beth have their hands raised okay uh, susan thanks on that last uh example and you were talking about pearson points or, or casino points whatever at this no, no i didn't I, was, I did not discuss opening in the fourth seat today no i know you didn't but it doesn't meet the rule for four seat. So I guess four seat, you would not open it. No, I, I wouldn't. No, if it's come past, past, past to me and I've got 11 points, I figured that everybody's got nine, 10 or 11 points and it's too dangerous to open the bidding and have the opponents take the contract in spades. Right, well in third seat, you're sitting there with that pancake hand that you say you always discount. Well, that doesn't matter. I mean, I've, I've got 11 high card points and I certainly want my partner to lead a club if he happens to be uh, uh, the opening leader. Um, so I don't have a problem at all opening this hand. So uh, it's, it's, it's as much lead directing as anything else. Yes, well, this is third hand too. Remember my partner's a past hand. He may or may not even be able to bid in response to one club, I don't know. But I mean, my left hand opponent could have had a two no trump opening for all I know, uh, and the other two hands can be very weak. So I I just want him with with this many points and sitting in third seat. Uh, my bid is lead directing as much as anything else. And if he has enough to bid, I have three card support, and I don't feel bad about it at all. Does that make sense? Very much. Thank you. Okay. Did you say Gail had a question? Somebody else had a question. Uh, Beth. Beth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure on that last hand that I got that right. You Was it because your partner was a past hand? If you open and you said he's going to bid something and you're just going to pass and let yeah, him. Yeah, he, he can't force. He's a past hand. That's right. Okay. I want to make sure I got that right. You did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Susan, I have a quick question. In that beginning bridge using two over one book that I have, mm -hmm. I thought I had read that if you have a void, it's discouraged to bid uh, a preempt have a preemptive bid. That has never made sense to me. Is there well really because that? because that's generally with a week two opening, Cindy. When you have a void in your hand, you know, when you when you use a week two, you do you describe a hand with generally five to ten high card points and a decent six card suit. If you're if you're vulnerable, you have a good six card suit. Uh, and your partner will make decisions based on the kind of playing strength that that implies. But if you have a void in your hand and you use a week two, the hand has a lot more playing strength than a week two bid describes. Some people just want to be able to use a week two bid when, whenever they have six cards in the suit, so they don't use disciplined week twos. But I've seen people open, two, for instance, two spades with a void and partner bids four spades, but in reality, they made six because the week two bidder had a hand with way more playing strength than the responder thought he had. And that's the problem. Occasionally, you will underbid seriously. This, this is an extreme example, but I actually saw it happen at the table by my opponents. Whereas if you pass, if the person holding that hand passes and then his partner opens, there's a much better likelihood that they're going to find a slam when, if they have the skills, let's put it that way. Um, if, if 
the week the the potential week two bidder has the opportunity to describe his hand accurately or to to bid based on his partner's description of his hand you're far more likely to find that six spades in that situation than you are otherwise now some people don't care they say that happens so seldom i don't care you know well you're going to miss games too because you have far more playing strength than you have let on oh that makes sense and i yes that makes sense i yeah i like that okay good <laughs> uh but no outside four card major suit because you and that's not true of, of three level bids uh, but for a week two, I never open a week two if I have an outside four card major because I have another viable trump suit. Um, if my partner happens to have four cards in, in that major suit as well, and I've opened a week two, if he doesn't have a hand with sufficient strength, he's going to pass. And we've missed a four, four heart fit or spade fit or whatever. And turns out we make, we can make 140 instead of 110. And my undisciplined bidding of that week two diamonds or whatever, uh, or if I open two hearts and I have four spades in my hand, my partner has one heart and five or six, well, I won't say six, maybe four or five spades in his hand. I've done us no favors, no favors at all by opening a week two when I have an outside four card major. I realize that, that with the current, style of bidding that's around you know the no holds barred all that cowboys in other words that this isn't terribly popular but my my point is to be more constructive with my week two bids and more destructive with my three and four level bids uh, that's that's just my style though and as don said uh every partnership has their own style no, I've read that. So you only were saying you were zeroing in on week two. So if it's a preemptive bid with on the three level and a, and you have a four card major, that you don't use that rule. No, well, and I generally am going to have seven cards in the suit I bid. And, right. uh, and I typically, you know, have seven or eight points at the most. And uh, I just, I just don't worry about that, particularly uh, if, particularly if my partner passed. Well, we could have a 4-4 fit in a major suit, but we don't have the money to find it, you know? So that's Thanks. the other aspect of this game is you don't always find your best fit if you lack the values to be able to do it, you know? Thank you. That that helps. Good. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Susan. This oh, was a you bet. lesson. Hi, this is Susan. Thanks for watching this video today. Most of these videos come from our free bridge lessons that we present on Zoom every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time. If you'd like to join us for those lessons, you can email us at the address shown below and we'll send you the link. If you can't attend the lessons, then feel free to subscribe to our channel and you'll be notified when there is a new one added. Again, Thanks for stopping by and we hope to see you soon.